Welcome to the uh, final session of papers, I think it is for the day. And this is our uh, some student researchers who are presenting their work to us this afternoon. And it's really delightful to be part of this and to see what uh, what our students, are, what the students in the simulation community are working on, and uh, and to have an opportunity to provide them with some feedback. We've got an extended amount of time available today, so that. Uh, rather than the quick short Q&A, but so that we can really delve into um, some feedback for the, for the students in this session. So thank you to the students for submitting your work to the Congress and for being part of this session. I really do hope you get a lot of value out of, out of the time together this afternoon. Um, so with no further ado, so I'm just juggling two computers for the moment, uh, we'll get going. And our very first presenter that we have, is Andrew and Andrew is speaking to us today uh, about quantifying in-game task difficulty using real-time cognitive load. Thanks Andrew, you have 15 minutes to speak and towards the end of the 15 minutes uh, I will turn my camera back on. Sorry I was just finding the mute button. Thank you very much for, uh, for joining me. I hope everyone can see my slides. Yes, we can. Thanks, Andrew. Wonderful. All right. So obviously serious games and simulation training is an ever-growing field with adoption across a really wide range of applications and industries. Um, these games and simulations seek to create educational experiences that are engaging, challenging, and enhance learning or training outcomes. And typically, these types of games to date have had a bit of a one-size-fits-all approach, and that may not necessarily be suitable for all players. So, for example, the game may be too difficult uh, for some or too easy for others. To tackle this problem, Dynamic Difficulty Adjustment, or DDA, is a method of adapting various game mechanics and learning content to better match the needs of the player. Um, it's relatively common in entertainment games, but a bit less so in serious games. So typically, DDA is supported by the concept of flow and the desire to achieve the optimal level of challenge for each individual player. However, the impact of these adjustments to the level of difficulty ranging from changes to the environment or game mechanics is not straightforward, particularly in respect of whether they effectively reduce or increase cognitive load. So cognitive load refers to the mental capacity or working memory of the player. If the player's cognitive load is either over or underburdened, some potential negative outcomes can occur. Things like boredom, frustration, disengagement, and potential failure. So there aren't many studies exploring the effect over time of different tasks, environments, and challenges on both player performance and cognitive load in complex simulated environments. In order to understand the impact of different design choices, both during game development and as applied to any form of adaptive system, it's important to understand the impact these choices are likely to have on cognitive load and player performance. So this presentation describes the development process and rationale for a 3D series driving game we termed the cognitive effects driving game. And it's a first person 3D game designed specifically to explore how different game tasks, environments, aesthetics, challenges, all affect cognitive load and performance in real time. Additionally, the game has been used to validate a virtual in-game version of the detection response task or DRT that we've just termed the virtual DRT. So overall, this experiment is seeking to answer six core questions around cognitive load player performance. There's been a fair amount of research on what happens to cognitive load in a range of different experiments. However, these experiments are often in very controlled settings that may not be particularly applicable in the real world, or they may have a very narrow focus with few variables. So what we're seeking or sought to explore is what happens to cognitive load in a complex game-based environment, incorporating many challenges of aesthetic differences and tasks. So more akin to real world training uh, games and simulations. We're exploring the dynamic relationship of cognitive load and player performance in these sorts of serious games and simulations. For example, can you even infer cognitive load from performance? So additionally, 
the virtual DRT is being validated as an effective measure of cognitive load in real time using only a default game controller. So the vert or the virtual DRT uses the parameters of the DRT detailed in ISO standard 17488. And the difference is purely around the input method and the embedded nature of this approach, being that the virtual DRT is integrated into a player controller, which you can see on screen, and a red dot appears on screen or a heads up display and not on a remotely mounted device. If successful, this means that a DRT based cognitive load measure could be integrated by game controllers in many different settings and games for next to no cost with no setup and potentially rapid adoption for learning use. The DRT standard requires that a participant responds to signals via an index finger button press. And this index finger response is placed on the preferred finger of the player. So to me, this action seemed pretty similar to using a trigger button on a PlayStation controller as depicted in the screen. And you can see in the black and white image how a little uh, trigger button is pressed is attached to the finger. So noting that, I developed the input system to enable trigger button input using either button, and I made the car control similar to those found in the popular game Grand Turismo using the X and the square. So we've gathered metrics on how a wide range of weather, lighting, tasks, difficulty levels, and virtual environment affect cognitive load and performance. And from that, we aim to develop a validated toolbox of methods that can be confidently used to affect difficulty in 3D games in specific ways. We're also looking at how cognitive load compares with a range of other aspects like uh, engagement or frustration, boredom, and so forth. The aim of all of this is to understand how performance and cognitive load are affected by a range of in-game real-time variables and how those variables impact cognitive load and performance. From which, hopefully, uh, will, it'll enable us to infer a learning sweet spot, exhibiting a balance of optimal challenge, cognitive load and performance. And from this, we aim to develop a DDA system or a dynamic difficulty adjustment system that enhances training outcomes. Due to the complexity of the game environment and the number of tasks involved in the game, there is an opportunity to gather a huge amount of data. Um, so we decided to just gather as much as possible in order to later be able to best cover all eventualities. The data collection is categorized into three broad groups. So cognitive load data, performance, grouping, and player preferences and demographics. One of the key goals, as mentioned already, is to validate that virtual DRT and also see if this implementation affects cognitive load or performance. Well, because we're validating our implementation of the DRT, we needed an additional measure of cognitive load in real time. So we chose to use an EEG. In this case, it's an emotive Epoch X and the associated emotive pro software. We selected the theta alpha ratio or TAR method of cognitive load estimation for our EEG application as it was validated and relatively simple to calculate. And finally, we added the NASA TLX to gather a post-experiment subjective measure of overall cognitive load from the game. And the NASA TLX is obviously also a validated measure of cognitive load, and we've included it as just a final check and balance on our other measures, albeit covering the entire session as opposed to being in real time. So interestingly, the EEG also collects what the software terms uh, performance metrics. And this is what I mentioned before, it includes, but isn't limited to measures of engagement, frustration, excitement, boredom, and more. And we plan to explore these measures more fully in future papers. During the game, we collected ongoing and task specific performance metrics. These include player position, uh, the time taken to date, lane deviations, crashes into objects, and other cars on the track. So time, cra all crashes and lane deviations, we chose as our uh, three key performance metrics. In addition, throughout, we present the player with a range of specific tasks, um, which I'll cover very soon, um, which have task specific results that offer different kinds of cognitive challenges. Finally, uh, we recorded footage of each session uh, for later review, clarification and comparison. So, Obviously by my tone, you can tell we've done the experiment. And in the end, we had 33 participants, uh, 23 males and 10 females and an average age of 28. 
And the data collection is still being analysed uh, and papers based on this experiment are shortly forthcoming. So the image on the left is one of our participants engaged in the game, and this is the same setup for each player. Um, the participants wearing the wireless EEG and using the game controller. To summarise, I'll give you the details about the actual game. There are three game levels with different biomes. One is a city, a forest and a desert, and they were all undertaken in a random order. Within each level, the road or track is identical and takes approximately five minutes per circuit, depending on player skill. The player had to undertake two full circuits of each level, one with the DRT active and one without. And again, that was done in a random order. So throughout the levels, the players were presented with tasks, as I mentioned, in addition to just driving. Uh, there are also some easier sections with no tasks and finally sections with no secondary tasks, but different levels of difficulty. These variations are intended to manipulate the cognitive load of participants throughout the whole experiment. In addition to the biome changes, uh, biome changes in each level, we also tweak light and weather conditions. Um, just for note, there is a tutorial level, and that took approximately five minutes to complete. It's very simple and is designed to just enable the player to become familiar with driving and the DRT controls. As you can see in the image on the right, there are 10 zones or sections per level. Uh, some have additional tasks and some are designed to be harder and others easier just to see what effect that has on cognitive load across the whole game. So the zones are uh, the start and the, at the start, the player is asked to count um, colour dukes parked beside the road. The placement and colour vary on each lap and each level. In zone two, the player is given a series of audio directions to follow right at the start, and then how well they can remember and follow those if recorded. For example, one of the directions is take the next right, take the first left, then the next right, and at the end, turn left. And the player has to try and recall that as they drive through. Zone three is just a break. There's nothing in there, a bit of a rest. And zone four has no extra tasks, but the absolute difficulty of the driving task was increased by making the road itself very difficult and challenging. Uh, when we get to zone five, follow and count test, the player is asked to stay a set distance or within a distance range behind a car, they're tasked to follow. In addition, about halfway through that zone, the game pauses and they need to try and recall the number of utes they counted earlier in zone one. Zone six is they continue to follow, but this time the weather changes in the thunder and lightning. Zone seven, uh, it just becomes a normal drive with a narrow section at the start with continued bad weather. Zone eight, which is right at the top right, uh, they have to drive through a narrow tunnel, but only with headlights, so the lighting conditions change. Zone nine, there's a bit of a break. And zone 10, the final zone, they have to cross a bridge with roadworks and oncoming traffic, and the player is required to judge when it's safe to proceed and, and, and go through. And as I said, they do that twice per level. So I've created a short video, which is obviously more entertaining to watch than just listen to me talk of the gameplay footage. And I've edited it all together into just one quick loop. Um, the video is only two minutes and it will show you the DRT active and other things. So this is the tutorial level. It's very bland and very simple. And here we go at the start of, one, of the first level, zone one. You can see the red dot appearing, which is the DRT. That's the forest. changing to the desert level, you can see the cars parked or the utes parked. They're in different spots each time, different colors into the city. You can see the directions are pretty, pretty standard. So we made this whole thing in Unity and used the standard Unity assets. This little residential area is where they're given directions, uh, audio directions to follow. We skipped ahead to zone four, which is the challenging driving section. As you can see, there's dips, there's crests. It's hard to see what's coming. Here we've got the follow section. Now that's writing turns red if the player gets beyond the, uh, the scope. Entering the, if they remember. And here we can see the thunder and lightning beginning to come over. In the game with audio, the thunder's quite loud. Narrow section they have to narrow, navigate. And again, continued rain and lightning.
Now the tunnel is much longer than it appears in this edited version, but you can see it's quite narrow and not a lot of view. Again, in the real game, it's much longer. We're just coming up to the final zone, which is crossing the bridge. As you can see, I think this person was about to crash, but I cut away just before they do. There you go. All right, so that's just a short two minute video. So we collected a lot of data from that. Um, here we see two lots of data on this page. On the right, or the right is some player performance data showing averages, it's got different aspects, and absolute totals broken down into with the DRT active, which is the gray lines, and not active, which is the white lines. Uh, on the left, uh, we have our DRT response times hit rates that are displayed as averages. So the DRT standard states that a data segment must exceed a duration of five seconds to qualify for analysis, which guarantees that it will include at least one stimulus. In addition, at least five stimuli should be included in the analysis of each task. Therefore, as each zone constituted for our purposes a different task, the responses were averaged into blocks of five to nine per zone and represented in the graph above. So the blue line is the DRT response times and the uh, bars or columns are the hit rates of the DRT. So the red bars indicate where the hit rate uh, falls below 80%. In other words, uh, the player is missing more than one in five stimuli. These misses tended to also indicate higher cognitive load. So by comparing the red bars to the video and performance metrics, it's become clear in preliminary analysis that high miss rates so far appear to correlate with significant things like field call crashes, which is obviously a high stress, highly emotive moment that requires a sudden surge in focus and often causes the player to jump. Uh, these incidents also correlate in the EEG data uh, with significant artifacts brought about by head movement or muscle clenching and blinking, all of which occur when the player crashes and jumps in the chair and sits up straight all of a sudden to try and get back on track. So one more minute, Andrew. Thank you. Importantly, it does look like uh, the DRT is working uh, correctly. So to wrap up, um, where to next? So we're going to obviously continue to examine the data to fully answer the initial six questions and use those answers to develop a dual adaption method that is applicable in real world settings that can use different cognitive load measures, not always DRT. And we're exploring a concept of mastery centered on cognitive load and performance. So fundamentally, we aim to create a DDA system that adapts to the needs of the user to get as close to one-to-one -one training as possible, i.e. not just treating every person the same. If you're interested in seeing the full working paper, there is a link in my presentation. Thank you very much. And sorry for going slightly over. Great timing. Thanks very much, Andrew. We'll keep moving on and then we'll come back to the questions at the end after all the presentations. So the next person I'd like to introduce is Linda. Linda's going to talk about her research exploring factors that affect learner engagement in simulation. Thanks, Linda. I'll pop my head on and say a minute at the end. Okay, okay so good afternoon and thanks for the introduction, Deanna. Uh, I currently am a third year part-time Masters of Philosophy student at Sydney University and I'm under the supervision of Associate Professor Christopher Gordon and Dr Belinda Judd. So my talk today is about presenting the progress of a study looking at the factors that affect learner engagement in simulation. So simulation-based education in health is now tightly embedded and accepted as an effective teaching modality for the education of pre- and post-registration healthcare professionals. It's well known that simulation is a tool that assists development of healthcare professionals' knowledge and it bridges the gap from theory to practice through the use of deliberate practice. The benefits of simulation-based education are numerous and they're well documented throughout the literature such as allowing learners to improve complex skills and technique, be that both common and uncommon in clinical settings, improve communication skills, teamwork, clinical decision-making, and improve learner, learner confidence in a safe learning environment, all at the same time without harming our patients. 
But throughout the literature, there's a huge emphasis that's been placed on the importance of participant engagement in simulation in order to foster the development of knowledge, learning and understanding. The engagement, therefore, is considered to be a core feature of the educational process associated with simulation based education. So if the concept of engagement is essential to learning in simulation, how are we able to optimise engagement for our learners? The important thing is to be able to appropriately define engagement, measure it well, and then determine the factors that may affect engagement in simulation. From these simulation educators could then use the results to help design simulation programs, tailor the pre-briefings and debriefings, and potentially screen participants for the risk of disengagement. So what does engagement actually mean? We searched the literature for a clear definition of engagement so that we could understand exactly what it was. What became evident really quickly was the numerous definitions and many inconsistencies that existed when attempting to gain a clear description. Uh, just on the screen, just a few of the examples that were found which attempted to describe engagement. So what we found was the most common suggested explanation of engagement is that it is a multi-dimensional construct consisting of cognitive, behavioural and emotional components. Cognitive engagement refers to the critical thinking, motivation and persistence. Behavioural engagement is the actual participation in the activity and the emotional engagement is the positive or negative reactions that an activity evokes. Engagement appears to be important to learning, yet difficult to clearly define, quantify and evaluate. Therefore, there needs to be a better understanding of how engagement can be measured and assessed during simulation-based education opportunities. So a search was conducted within the healthcare simulation literature for a validated empirical measurement tool for engagement. Unfortunately, the search neglected to identify a tool that could be used, despite many papers stating that engagement had occurred with the learners in the simulation, that knowledge or skills had, in, had improved because of the learner engagement in the simulation. So the search was then expanded to the educational literature where there's been lots of research performed for many years on how to improve engagement in primary school children up to tertiary students. A tool to measure engagement in university students was found to be appropriate and applied to our study. This measuring tool was described by Jang in 2008 who examined engagement in university students who were involved in different learning activities. This tool focused specifically on the students on task attention, their effort and their persistence. So the aim of our study was to determine the factors that may affect in learner engagement in simulation. And the way we did this uh, was an observational study using a mixed method approach. So we had post-registration healthcare workers consisting of medical and nursing enrolled in our study. All the participants were employees of Western Sydney local health district. And this consisted of Blacktown Mount Druitt, Westmead and Auburn hospital staff. The study was performed at the Australian Institute of Medical Simulation and Innovation, um, better known as AIMSI, which is a simulation centre located on the grounds of Blacktown Hospital. The research was comprised of uh, three sections. We broke it down into three parts. So the first part was the pre-simulation. Once the participants had arrived for their allocated simulation education sessions and had consented to the study, um, they were given a colour-coded lanyard and a questionnaire to complete. And this questionnaire consisted of five, uh, five questionnaires and then two post-simulation questionnaires. In the pre-simulation questionnaires, we asked the participants demographic information and we also included how many previous simulations they had participated in. 
We also asked them what they felt uh, their personality type was, and we used the tippy scale, what their learning styles were. We used the bark. We asked their current anxiety level using the state trait anxiety inventory and a self-efficacy scale. These tools were all chosen as they were factors suggested in the literature that may influence a learner's engagement in an educational activity. The second part was actual participation in the simulation. So once they'd completed the pre-simulation questionnaire, the simulation took place and they uh, participated in that simulation. Now these simulations were video recorded for engagement scoring by researchers. This was performed at a later date due to the complexity and difficulty of being able to observe and score participants individually within the simulations. Video recording of simulation was routinely performed at AIMSI. The third part, which was the post simulation. So once the simulation had concluded, the participants would then debrief the simulation with their instructor. And at the conclusion of the debrief, participants were instructed to continue completing the questionnaire. We asked the participants to identify if they felt the simulation scenario was authentic, was it realistic and relevant to their position? Did they feel safe and potentially uh, safe and, and able to make mistakes? Uh, did they feel their professional identity was safe as well? Finally, a self-reported engagement scale asked the participants if they were sure what they needed to do during the simulation. Was it a valuable and enjoyable learning experience? And overall, how engaged did they feel within that simulation? After all the data was collected, the recorded videos were then watched and each participant was scored using the adapted Jang scale. And we looked at their attention, their effort and persistence within the simulation. These are just a couple of the sims that were conducted, um, just the different groups, different kinds of scenarios that were held at AIMSI. So the results of our study, in terms of uh, the results, we had 118 participants that were included in the study. This was out of a total of 143 uh, potential eligible learners which gave a representation rate of 82%. A few of those learners had participated in this, had come back and participated in simulations twice, so they weren't eligible to be um, included again in the study. The demographic results are shown in the table. As you can see, over half of the pop, uh, participants were aged between 20 to 30, uh, just over were half were female, sorry. Unfortunately, in terms of professions, we only had nursing and medicine and no allied health or midwifery representation. And this was a result of pre-book simulations. So the simulations are booked at certain times throughout the year. Allied health had been booked for a later date, but unfortunately, due to the pandemic arriving, uh, it stopped us from recruiting any other participants. So we just used what we had. In terms of our preliminary findings, overall participants were highly engaged in the simulation scenarios. Age appears to be a strong predictive factor of engagement. Uh, there was a negative correlation suggesting that younger participants were more engaged than older participants. Interestingly, the other variables such as anxiety, learning styles, et cetera, didn't add much to the model, which was uh, a surprise as we thought they might have an effect on engagement. Further modelling and data analysis is underway to highlight whether other factors also impact, impact learner engagement in simulation. So the significance of our findings, the results of this study will provide insight into the factors that affect learner engagement, which in turn will help with the improvement of the development of simulation programs. We aim to discover if some of these components of engagement can be improved for a learner to embrace a simulation and make it a valuable learning experience. Can we better tailor sim programs to age and level of experience of the learner and highlight the relevance to clinical practice for different types of participants? Are engagement levels different between healthcare professionals? Can pre-briefs be improved to better engage our learners? We are looking at ways to better engage our learners 
and uh, specific answers will be related to our final results. Ultimately, we want to have engaged learners in our simulations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. I see a number of questions have come in from Linda. Could I just remind people when you're popping the questions in because we are um, going to do all of them together, maybe to just address the question to uh, a particular person when you put them in. It's great to see those questions coming through. Our next presenter is Josh. And Josh is going to talk to us about, sorry, I'm juggling my technologies here. Um, Thresholds for detecting changes as distinct from differences during simulated spinal motion palpation. Thank you, Josh. Um, hey, everyone. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so yeah, today I'll just be presenting my thesis topic, which is just titled Thresholds for Detecting Changes as Distinct from Differences in Force Location Stiffness During Simulated Spinal Motion Palpation. These are just the contents that uh, we'll be running through to today's slides. So spinal pain. Spinal pain is used to describe pain experienced in the cervical, thoracic, or lumbar regions of the spine. It arises from various structures of the spine and represents a large portion of challenges in the chronic pain settings. Its lifetime prevalence, as you can see on the screen, is as high as 78.2%. In Western society, low back pain is a major problem for the public health system and is a disorder with various potential etiologies due to the complex anatomy and function of the spine. To help identify possible sources of low back pain, doctors can order medical imaging when a specific pathology, such as a spinal canal stenosis, is expected. However, own about 90% of patients actually don't have a specific diagnosis, and these are termed non-specific. And since a clear pathoanatomical cause cannot be found for most patients with low back pain, assessment and treatment rely on the pattern of findings in the physical assessment and treatment. So touch is one of the five human senses and is a fundamental approach for interaction with the external environment. Human touch involves a wide range of discriminable and sensible qualities, which include distinguishing the shape and location of objects, along with sensing thermal properties, textures, weight, solidity, elasticity, and vibration. And the most common intensive measure of absolute tactile sensitivity, which basically means the smallest intensity that is just noticeable, is pressure threshold. Spinal palpation is a touch-related diagnostic procedure we use in physiotherapy. In particular, the information gathered from spinal palpation can be used to evaluate the quantity and quality of segmental spinal motion. Spinal palpation is difficult for students to learn, however, because one, it is very difficult for students to know if what they're perceiving is what the teacher is perceiving, and two, in the manual therapy classes where they're being taught, there is a poor teacher-to-student ratio. So devices like the virtual haptic back have been developed to address limitations that exist in settings like uh, the manual therapy practical classes. So um, haptic devices are an innovation that use forced and tactile feedback. The forced feedback simulates the weight, hardness, and inertia of objects. These devices allow for interaction with a virtual environment through a haptic interface. Um, in the field of dentistry, the Simodont advanced simulation units uh, uses haptic technology to uses to feel variation in layers of the tooth. And in the medical field, the virtual haptic back simulates the textures and contours of the human back to allow medical students the opportunity to practice palpation techniques. So um, in regards to the current study, it used the electromagnetic force feedback device, which was used to simulate PA mobilization. Now, the importance of the ability to perceive dynamic changes. So physiotherapy is recognized as a key intervention for patients with low back pain. The assessment and treatment using manual therapy techniques form an important component of physiotherapy practice. One technique used routinely by clinicians to appraise segmental spinal stiffness is PA movement. Most of the literature on spinal stiffness has primarily focused on the ability to discriminate two spinal stiffnesses, which is a relevant skill for the physical assessment. PA mobilization is used for the treatment of patients with low back pain. When using PA mobilizations as a treatment modality, changes to patient impairments may occur. It is important to understand and refine our ability to detect dynamic changes in spinal movement so we can maximize the effectiveness of treatment by making real-time real adjustments to the technique parameters. At the current time of the study, 
uh, the ability to detect these dynamic changes has not been investigated to our knowledge. If we are to maximize the effectiveness of treatment and help our patients with low back pain to return to their previous level of function, we must understand the thresholds for detecting dynamic changes in spinal movement, which takes us to our aims and objectives, which is to determine uh, the ability of physiotherapy students during simulated motion palpation to detect dynamic changes in one uh, constant force, B, the stiffness at the end of the movement, and C, the location of R1 and also to determine if there was a relationship between a pair of parameters within participants. So uh, there was 40 physiotherapy participants that were recruited for the study and they participated in a one hour study. Their, we, the equipment that we used was called the DCA series linear actuator from Iris Dynamics Limited. And it was run through a software called Iris Controls 2, which was through a Windows 10 laptop. We can use what was called a two down, one up adaptive staircase approach, which is something I'll touch up on later. And in terms of the uh, device settings, we adjusted it to model movements from in vivo studies of the lumbar spine, in vivo studies of the thoracic spine, and also uh, therapist perception of cervical spinal stiffness. So before we begin this slide, I'll just quickly explain what a movement diagram is. So movement diagrams are used as a clinical teaching tool and they're uh, used to describe the quality and quantity of passive movement perceived by a clinician. So these movement diagrams here are just an example of what the settings um, look like. So for our constant four setting, as you can see here, we move points three and four, uh, four and five up or down, and it uh, we indicated to the students to perceive the movement in between two and three. Now for stiffness, what we did was we moved points four and five up or down and participants were uh, indicated to palpate and detect the changes between three and four. And for the location of the first point of resistance, R1, we moved points three, four, five, either to the left or right. And it was between points two and three, which participants were feeling. And over here, you can see just the end product of our device. So our DCA series linear actuator was fixed to um, a wooden frame. And on the video on the right, it's just an example of just one of our participants performing a PA movement on the our device. So back to that adaptive staircase model I was talking about. So the protocol uh, is a two down, one up. It targets that 70.7% psychometric scale. And as you can see here, what participants will start off with is a baseline uh, level. So if you looked at force 105, which basically indicates the low for 105, me medium setting for 135 and high setting for 185, they will start off at 12. If the, this participant here got it incorrect, so what they would do is they would move up by adjustment of two newtons. And then they would perceive this change at 14 newtons. And as you can see here, this participant got it right twice. So as the two down, do you have to get two right to move down a level? So this participant got two right, they move down, and then they keep going until they get an incorrect response. And at this point here, once they get it wrong, they move up at an adjustment of two. And it's the X that indicates a reversal and the uh, experiment was terminated on three reversals. So as you can see here, these are the results from our um, study. So for the force, you can see here, um, there was a significant difference between the low force and high force, but nothing for the medium force. And because we did a one repeated measures ANOVA, we found the significance for the main effect. And if there was a significance for the main effect, we would then use a percentage change. And over here, you can see, there's no actual overlap of um, significant difference here. In regards to stiffness, um, there was no significant difference between the levels, but you can see over here that there was on the percent side. And then in terms of location, you can see they were really consistent between the different settings. And one thing I would like to highlight as well is you can see the individual performance indicated by the plus, and you can see that there's actually a very huge variability in terms of student performance. In terms of looking at the relationship, you can see here the relationship between a change in force and also the ability to detect a change in stiffness. And this had the strongest relationship out of the three that we will look at in the next slides. 
here is just a demonstration of just the location of R1 change and also the change in force, not as strong as the previous slide. And then here was the weakest relationship of uh, the three. So the location R1 is stiffness. And again, just to highlight, you can see the really huge variability between the performance between the students. So before I begin this slide, um, I would just like to explain what a Weber fraction is because Weber fractions has been used to uh, explain and used in research looking at spinal stiffness discrimination. So Weber fractions have been used uh, to describe a characteristic of people's perception of a constant stimuli because of a relationship between the thresholds and stimulus intensity. Uh, Weber fractions is a ratio of minimum difference that an individual can discriminate to the standard intensity of a stimulus in a sensory modality. So as you can see from our results, a magnitude of force influences, but it does not determine the perception of dynamic changes in constant force. Uh, it was pretty consistent throughout in terms of the percentage threshold across the different levels where it was around 10%. And our normal principles of Weber fractions uh, applied only for the low and high force settings of 0.12 and 0.09. And to kind of give you a reference point, most of the literature on force in the assessment part has uh, stated a Weber fraction is roughly around 0.22. And again, just to highlight, there was a large variability in student performance, which factored, which ranged from a factor of nine to 16. Now for stiffness, again, magnitude of stiffness influences, but does not determine the perception of dynamic change in stiffness. And it was not consistent in terms of the percentage threshold across different levels of stiffness, which was around 11 to 80%. Now, interestingly enough, normal principles of Weber fractions did not apply here. Um, again, uh, like the previous in force, there was a large variability in terms of student performance, which factored by two to nine. And in terms of location of R1, magnitude of location does not influence the ability to perceive dynamic changes. Uh, the threshold value is just listed up here. And again, normal principles of rubber fractions did not apply. And it was really hard to compare because this is the first of its study looking at the treatments. So what does this all mean? So uh, one, because PA movement is very hard to learn and master, potentially we can really use a simulator to kind of progress students learning. And my uh, thesis topic is just one of a bigger project, which next year's students will be looking at uh, using what's called an adaptive learning model. Same kind of approach with this adaptive staircase model. However, the device will cater to the student's baseline level of performance. And our, just to really highlight, our results really indicate that there are good students who are really good at detecting changes, and then there are not so good students. So potentially one, teachers can spend more time with these students to help them re um, reach at a baseline level of detection, or two, potentially we can accelerate the program and we can potentially integrate a simulator in our uh, program so that we can accelerate these students learning. Um, so like I said, this is just the first of a bigger study and hopefully within a few years, we could see this device um, out in different programs. And these are just the references. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Josh. I just got to adjust my uh, timing. We're running a little bit ahead of schedule, which is great. It gives us some more time later on. Coming up to our last presentation, uh, we have uh, Gabriel from Deakin. And Gabriel is going to talk to us about the implementation of the Good Sam first on scene simulation improves medical student confidence in responding to cardiac arrest. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you guys. And I'll just check that you can see the slides. That's all right. Yes, we can. Thank you. Oh, brilliant. So um, yeah, just quickly. So uh, my name is Gabriel. I'm a first year medical student at Deakin University. Uh, and my, my previous life is working as a paramedic. Um, so this presentation is basically to give an overview of um, essentially a novel student led project um, in conjunction with faculty this year at Deakin University. Um, and based around a, a cardiac arrest sort of training program using simulation. Um, and 
given the year that it's been, also discuss some of the challenges that we faced with the disruption from uh, from COVID restrictions in Victoria and some of the attempts we've made to um, to adapt to that in a you know sort of sustainably and and, and low cost format. Um, so I'll start with a little bit of of background. Um, there we go, lovely. Um, so to begin, um, Good Sam, for those who aren't familiar with it, is an, a mobile phone app that is integrated with the Dispatch Centre for Ambulance Victoria. And it enables Ambulance Victoria call, call takers to alert um, volunteers in the community uh, to a cardiac arrest in their immediate vicinity that they might then respond themselves at the same time as an ambulance, but arrive there first due to their local proximity. Um, and that enables those volunteers to perform CPR in the sort of incredibly crucial intervening periods before an ambulance arrives, um, which more and more evidence is showing are, are, are potentially the, the most important elements of a, of a cardiac arrest's trajectory. Um, so it's, a, it's an incredibly unique um, opportunity to improve cardiac arrest outcomes. Uh, and what we realised or what I, I believed coming into the, the DECAN program is that, that medical students are essentially the, the ideal responders. Um, the, the criteria from Ambulance Victoria and Good Sam is that you don't even need a first aid certificate. You simply need to be enthusiastic and willing. Um, and DECAN medical students are trained in CPR in their first semester of the program. But they're also very passionate, generally, um, very keen to help people uh, and most importantly, generally looking for any experience they can possibly get their hands on. Um, so the, the logical conclusion would be that they would absolutely want to participate in, um, in a volunteer app program such as this. But um, somewhat surprisingly, what uh, came out is that in, in discussions, many students were actually very hesitant to register and many students felt that they were not um, confident enough to do so. Um, so when talking this through, it, it seemed to appear that students felt capable to perform the um, technical skill that was CPR, which they were trained in, but they weren't so confident to respond to a cardiac arrest holistically. Um, uh, go, they weren't confident in their ability to realise that technical skill within the like additional stresses of a real world context as a first responder. Uh, and the reasons for this probably are uh, not entirely sure about. One probable factor, I think, is that um, this year has been almost entirely online in Victoria um, with almost all medical teachings, except for this last little bit of the semester. Um, and perhaps that students are feeling particularly um, disconnected from the clinical aspects of, of the craft they're building. Um, so with that in mind, simulation really seem to be the ideal context to build some of that confidence in the whole scenario uh, in a safe environment. And considering that um, I approached Kelly Britt, who is uh, uh, head of our clinical teaching in first year um, and probably well known to some of the people here. Um, and together we uh, did a bit of brainstorming and designed a program aimed to build some of that confidence. Um, so specifically the intention was to build on the basic life support training or the CPR training that students already had and it, it, it try to equip them with some of the non-technical skills involved in the um, scenario of a cardiac arrest. Uh, firstly, we tried to um, teach them a framework for approaching an emergency scenario and we um, borrowed a framework from the literature by um, Cliff Reed and colleagues called the Step Up Approach, um, which has uh, people go through self-team environment and then engage the patient and update and, and set some priorities for the next um, the next steps. And then we also worked through some techniques for maintaining composure uh, and basically keeping your cool during acute stress, such as a medical emergency. And again, used um, a, a framework of breathe, talk, see, focus as um, four little tools that could be implemented in the moment to, um, to hopefully achieve that composure. So um, our, the, the program itself was, I guess, a little bit atypical for a few reasons. Firstly, because it was an entirely extracurricular program um, led by myself and, and, and the student body with the help of, of the faculty. And so all attendance and participation was voluntary. Um, but also the core aim was to improve confidence rather than 
assess students or observe their competence um, in the particular skill that is performing CPR in an emergency. And for this reason, we made a very heavy focus on building a positive student experience um, and facilitating self-reflection on that experience as probably the absolute main intention. Um, so using a pretty, um, pretty classic sort of scaffolding approach, we broke this into an initial presentation um, of, of key techniques in a um, just a lecture style format. And then subsequently the intention was to have a second session two weeks later with scenarios and uh, structured debriefing in which students could work through the new um, ideas that they'd been presented with. Uh, and in the second session, there would be small group simulations with volunteer facilitators from the School of Medicine faculty uh, and structured debriefing. And I'll go into a little bit more um, detail on that shortly, but essentially the goal in the end was that students would be confident enough to respond to this scenario and thus confident enough to volunteer on this app uh, and hopefully actually make a difference in the, in the community um, down the track. So um, our initial presentation, pretty, pretty traditional, um, quite well attended for a, a Zoom presentation. And we think that that reflects quite a lot of enthusiasm from the student body um, for the content. So we had almost half of our cohorts, about 50 attendees from, from the first year cohort. Uh, and in this presentation, we described some of the um, epidemiological evidence around cardiac arrest, along with the evidence base for survival from cardiac arrest. Uh, and we presented the Good Sam app in, its, in all its glory that we think um, and uh, how students would sign up and, and the difference that they could make with that. And then we subsequently sort of shifted the major focus of the presentation onto introducing the uh, step up framework for approaching emergencies, the breathe, talk, see, focus, cognitive tools to um, improve performance during stress and maintain composure. And we also had a discussion um, about the elements of high quality CPR and, and optimal uh, CPR performance. Um, and this was concluded with a, a Q&A with a, a MICA, Mobile Intensive Care Ambulance, paramedic from Ambulance Victoria, who was kind enough to join us uh, and share some of their lived experience um, of responding to cardiac arrests. Um, so what you're seeing on this slide is uh, a debrief tool that we um, just put together for this and I'll, I'll come to that shortly. Um, but first I'll just give a little overview of the plan for the simulation sessions. Um, so these were to be held at the Deakin Medical School Skills Labs, which um, uh, are set up for, for simulation. Um, and the key goal, as I mentioned, was building student confidence. So the approach we were hoping to take here was to maintain quite small group numbers in separate rooms and to really ask students for buy-in within a, a small, um, quite intimate group um, so that they could commit um, without, that, uh, that, without that fear that comes with being in a larger group. Um, and then to build the, the confidence um, we use short but high throughput scenarios kind of replicating the real world situation of maybe the first 10 minutes of, of arriving at a cardiac arrest um, and this would be done so that students would conclude a sort of singular evening of simulation having either witnessed or participated in numerous simulation events um, and then to consolidate this experience students would uh, run their own debrief after participating in um, a scenario and that's where this uh, debrief tool came in and I'll, I'll just orient it to you quite quickly it is very simple um, the major areas that we talked about in our presentation and the major themes we introduced were cognitive tools so this breathe talk see focus uh, team tools so methods for maintaining team communication and ways to optimize the environment um, and then this is our self team environment and patient essentially on the top. And the idea was to create something quite proscriptive um, for students to use. And, and the reason for this was that we realized the majority of students were unlikely to have ever participated in a, in a simulation um, and certainly in a debrief as most of them were, were new to medicine. Um, and many of them came from quite varied backgrounds. So we realized that a, a structured um, debrief where they could draw immediate connections between the experience they just had and the key techniques that might um, might assist them was probably most most ideal for the the circumstance we had so um, for example a student who felt they were were quite stressed or quite um, uh, overwhelmed during the um, 
the simulation could work through that and then identify using their little flow chart, um, a, a cognitive tool that they think they could implement. And the facilitators um, would be there to assist students to draw connections um, that they maybe didn't notice, but also to link the experiences between students who would be debriefing in, in um, sequence. And unfortunately, there's a reason I'm speaking in future tense, and that's because um, just preceding our simulation date, we in Victoria had the quite familiar experience of entering COVID lockdown, I think number seven, um, and our university closed and we had to cancel our in-person simulation sessions, which was of course very disappointing. Um, so what we then faced with a quite a disrupted time frame for the entire project was um, I guess an intention to do the simulations and, and hopefully we'll be quite prepared for them by then, but how, how do we maintain engagement with the content initially presented um, when the initial time frame was two weeks um, and it would be quite fresh to something that was longer and also how would we do this without a budget given this is an extracurricular um, project and so what we ended up working out is to implement a, a, a way to facilitate mental rehearsal for the students who were booked in to, sim to come to these simulations um, and hopefully this would enable students to run through scenarios and make decisions or utilize techniques that they'd been introduced to whilst not actually being able to leave their house. Um, and hopefully keep some familiarity with those concepts until they were in fact able to, to come in for the simulations. And so um, the way we initiated this was, was appreciating that mental rehearsal is actually a skill that needs to be developed. And so we um, provided those students already registered for the simulations with mental rehearsal videos uh, that signpost for the moments to implement techniques. Um, and I've got a brief 30 second snippet from one of those videos. Um, so this is a short snippet of um, a police officer who was first on scene to a cardiac arrest wearing a body camera. Um, and I'm not a tech whiz, but we <laughs> interspersed this with, uh, with blank screens that would encourage students to pause and reflect on what their next actions should be um, with signs to utilize some of the core concepts that we presented. Um, from following this, the subsequent mail outs would be sequentially less intensively structured so that students could take more imagination themselves. Um, so I'm just going to play this briefly and don't worry, there's not actual CPR footage in this snippet. There is a little bit of audio from the person entering the house, but that's probably all that would be noteworthy. Count and remove anything under his head. Can take over. Count out loud so I can count with you, okay? Okay, okay. Here, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Um, so I paused it there so we don't actually have to look at any of the of the, of the true footage. Um, and uh, I'm, as I'm sure you can notice, I, I'm certainly not a tech whiz, um, but we, we hope that by utilizing something quite realistic, students are able to be as immersed as possible in a way that we could facilitate um, on, uh, I guess, a financially feasible background. So given that disruption, um, the, the next steps from here is that hoping and praying we will finally be able to actually conduct our simulation sessions utilizing our, our debriefing tool and through that we're able to um, actually gather our, our pre and post uh, evaluation data and, and subsequently review the session um, for whether it's whether it's been successful or not in improving student confidence um, it, with a view to the future um, perfect world would be that this can um, be proven successful and incorporated into the the um, the first semester curriculum um, but that will of course depend on the on the outcome when we get there um, and thinking of the the overall goal of the project the the hope is that um, we've been able to get some students motivated to join this uh, good sam app and hopefully make a difference and at least colloquially i know that we've had some some success there from from some people that have contacted me um, so that's just a brief overview on, on where we're at with this. Um, obviously, I'd like to say a really big thank you to, to Kelly Britt, um, who's given me a lot of help from the faculty side at Deakin in, in setting this project up. 
thank you to Leo Moran, who was the MICA paramedic who came and joined us. And thank you to Dr. Emma Timilty, who's a lecturer in ethics at Deakin, who um, gave us a bit of guidance. Um, just here are just the references for the two major tools that we used in our, um, in our presentations. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Okay. Congratulations to all four uh, student speakers for your excellent timing today. Um, I've chaired lots and lots of sessions at this conference over many years, and I've got to say they don't always run early or to time as you have, so well done. Okay, I'm just going to have a quick look at the questions. If you'd like to all pop your cameras on so we can see you, that would be great. And starting from the beginning, there's a couple of questions here, one from Susanna Whitney and one from Kelly Britt asking uh, if the speakers could repost the link to the full working paper, please, or to the paper. I think Susanna's question was directed toward Andrew and Kelly's question toward Linda. Um, I don't know if Kelly's here, but uh, if, if you don't have a, uh, the paper that you can add in the chat uh, or something, perhaps you could put some information uh, there about how people might be able to stay in touch with you and follow your work. Sure. Uh, the next question, Linda. Um, yes. from Jessica fascinating work did you come across the work by Paget et al 2019 on engagement and additionally have you considered the synonym of immersion as a proxy for engagement there's a validated scale for immersion from Northern Europe yes is that the Haguara one yes we did we did find that so we did find um, an immersion tool and we were we thought we'd struck gold, like, yep, this is it. But when we actually looked deeper into it, it was looking at that suspension of disbelief, which was related to immersion rather than engagement, looking at the three components. So we did consider that paper and believe me, I was super excited when I found it, but it just wasn't um, appropriate to be applied to our study. Um, so yeah, we did consider it. Thanks, Linda. And I see there's been a bit of toing and froing in that chat between uh, Belinda and and uh, Jess with some more um, info there. Belinda, uh, Linda, I don't know if you can see. No, the I chat. can't see the chat. Oh. No. All right, we'll make sure we get the information to you. Thank you. Uh, okay. I'll jump around a bit so that uh, everybody can sort of have a, have a turn. So Kelly's uh, put a question to Josh. Love this use of haptics. Do you think from what you've learned in this project, you could transfer to other health conditions for physio students, for example, knee or hip pain? Could a knee or shoulder haptic be developed for teaching, training and assessment? Again, can this learning be transferred to other health professional students? Um, thanks for your question. Um, I do believe that simulation does have a potential in physio, uh, particularly if there's any assessment or treatment that really requires us to be able to detect changes without um, hands. So in regards to your example of like the knee or hip, when we're using our uh, passive accessory movements, I do see a potential there to improve our techniques. And in terms of your um, other question, in terms of is it useful in other healthcare? I do believe so. So there's uh, simulators, like I said, in dentistry with the Simodont uh, unit, which looks at layers of teeth. And then it's also being used in the medical uh, field as well in terms of the virtual haptic back and improving that patient techniques. But yeah, after doing this thesis, I do believe that there is a place with simulators. And I do think it could really help accelerate students' learning if we're able to uh, progress these devices to an optimal level. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. And I, I note, um, uh, just moving on to a comment earlier, a question that Teal asked for Andrew, and I note, Andrew, you've mentioned, answered it in the chat um, about whether you'd looked at the road safety literature exploring cognitive load while driving. Um, and you had said there it was one of the reasons you chose a driving game as your first test. Did you want to elaborate on that at all? Yeah, essentially the DRT um, ISO standard came out of driving and assessment for uh, driver distraction and cognitive load in relation to dealing with, you know, new, um, well, dashboards and all those sorts of devices in driving. So it, it made a lot of sense if we we're going to validate something with that kind of background to make the first experiment um, 
while it's a game um, and acknowledge that, you know, we're not using a steering wheel and all those sorts of things. Um, initially, we were planning on a steering wheel. Uh, we decided to go with the DRT in, in a game, in, like a driving game environment, because at least it's kind of similar. Um, the point with the, the controller um, and, and noting the comment about the driving wheel or steering wheel, um, ultimately that DRT input can be anything that relies on the trigger button. So a lot of the game steering wheels have the flappy paddle gearbox, which again is a similar action. VR controllers also using similar action. So while we've used the driving game, it was really um, just for convenience and also ultimately, uh, Hopefully, it'll be applicable to, you know, any type of uh, simulation training. Obviously, things that don't require fine finger control for DRT, at least. But anyway, I'll stop there. Hey, thanks, Andrew. Uh, back to you, Linda. Um, Jess asks, have you published any work on this yet? Um, no, Jess, I haven't. I'm still in the process of writing up. So it will be there soon. Thanks, Linda. Gabriel, a question from Susanna. Great talk and great initiative. I was wondering if you'd thought about collecting any data from students to explore the reasons they don't feel comfortable signing up for Good Sam. Could you provide some, uh, it could provide some interesting insights about factors other than confidence that might be shaping their behaviour. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's that's actually an excellent suggestion, and probably something that that could be a little um, little paper in itself. I'm sure. Um, I think the the this was born out of wanting to do a project, and then subsequently um, thinking about about how we could try and evaluate that project. So at the time, the major focus was on um, how we're we building something. But um, absolutely, yeah. No, a very good point about um, there's there's probably a lot of different complex motivators, especially for something like that, which, which requires people to put themselves in a, in a quite unique situation. Um, and, and I guess there's probably further a bit you could look at about whether the transferability of, of being confident in a simulation actually meets across to the, the real life as well. So yeah, great, great idea. Thank you. Back to Linda. Did, did you find that the number of sim, prior simulations that people had done had an impact on engagement? Oh, we thought that would have a really big impact and actually it didn't have any impact at all. So all the things we thought were going to have an impact, you know, those personality styles, you learn, had no impact. So it was really surprising with the results, to be honest. So no, it didn't have an impact. Hmm. I wonder how that um, question would translate actually across other industries uh, outside of health. I, I have no even anecdotal evidence there, but it's a, it's a good question. Thanks yeah, Kelly for question. the question. <laughs> Talking about things that have impacts, Joshua from Marcus, um, really hard and important work. What happens if, some, if it turns out some people cannot learn to recognize the difference? Uh, thanks for your question. That's a very, very good question to ask. My, throw me a curveball here. Um, well, hopefully with the simulators, we can definitely help students improve. And I do believe like this skill is definitely something that you can learn. So with enough practice, you can definitely improve on your ability to notice small changes. It might be slower for some people compared to others, but if you work at it long enough, it is something that you could definitely improve on. Although directly answering it, if some students aren't able to detect it, I guess the hard, fast truth is maybe that skill, maybe there's different areas in physio. Maybe it's just something other than musculoskeletal that they might want to delve into because it is a really important skill to be able to uh, learn in order to detect these small changes. Otherwise, it's going to be pretty, pretty tough to treat patients with low back pain. Thanks, Josh. Marcus, I'm sure you have a follow-up comment or question if you're still here. Um, I'm coming back now to another question for Linda. Uh, great comment around pre-brief. Pre can we do this differently or better to improve engagement? 
Oh, that's not where I mean. Um, we're hoping further studies can um, actually allow that to happen. So that's what we're, that's that's our aim to improve our simulations, whether it be in that design of the pre-brief. You know, it might be just little things that need to be tweaked. So we'll see what the results show. Have you any uh, sort of sneak peeks or previews of that yet, or it's still Ooh, too early? Still too early. We've only just done results, but um, but it's it's the thought. That's what we're thinking. You know, it, it could just be. Um, yeah, the pre-brief that needs to change and then we can engage more learners. So yeah, we'll see, we'll see what the results show. I'm wondering whether there's any esteemed uh, colleagues out there in our audience as well who might have looked at that question uh, in other sectors. Perhaps it's not the specific question, but some, some tangential sidelines. Um, I don't have any more formal questions coming up. Does anyone have any other questions or, or comments they'd like to make to our student presenters? Um, congratulations on presenting while people are having a thought about that. Um, I know in the beginning, we were having a little bit of a chat about how difficult it is to, to get up and present um, in, an, in an environment like this, sometimes for the first time. And um, thank you for doing that and sharing your work. It is exciting work. And, and as you can see by the comments people are making and the questions, um, there's a lot of interest in watching how your work is developing. So thank you. Just quickly skimming through to see if there's any more comments. No, it looks like we might get an early mark, folks. We, uh, if there's no further questions, I do have a comment from Belinda. Congratulations, all quality presentations. Thanks, Belle, I agree. Really great. Thanks all. I'll let you get on with your with your afternoon. Thanks again for our presenters, Andrew Siderhelm, Linda Garrett, Joshua Nguyen and Gabriel Hicks. Thanks all for being from different universities. We'd really love to hear your feedback about your experience here in ways that we might actually um, help engage students and student researchers in the work that you're doing. So um, look forward to your, to your comments. Thank you to the audience for joining us uh, this afternoon. We're going to take an extended break now. There is a masterclass running in parallel to this session. And then we'd love to see you all come back at five o'clock for the closing address. Thanks very much.